thank you very much and thank you for that uh, kind introduction. So yes, I'm lucky that I don't have to uh, tell you everything uh, I am interested in in this talk, but I can chose to fo focus on the uh, Gordon and Lowe model uh, for optimal investment and information security. Uh, and as you remarked, uh, no, the, uh, the primary equation is, is not, as far as I know, on the curtain. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we'll discuss it and uh, you can decide afterwards whether you think it should be uh, uh, or, or not. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and, and to introduce this uh, to you. So um, what's the backdrop here? Well, uh, Perhaps not so surprisingly, um, uh, when we give a talk about information security, uh, the, the background, of course, is that, that modern society depends on, on digital services. Um, and therefore, it's important uh, and interesting to, to study how we can make them more secure. Uh, because, unfortunately, uh, even though we depend on them, uh, these services are not always uh, uh, dependable, so to speak. Uh, so I'm just giving you a small uh, uh, set here of of, um, of examples from the uh, from sort of recent uh, uh, news coverage. Uh, some of which uh, is uh, Swedish, some of which is international. Um, to give an overview of you know what we see in the news uh, all the time, uh, examples of breaches of one kind or another. Uh, Ulrich, uh, the slide hasn't changed. We are still seeing the your slide hasn't changed. You're right. So, new attempt. So, modern society depends on digital services, but unfortunately, these services are not always so dependable as we would like. So, a small selection of the kind of news media coverage that, unfortunately, uh, we see all the time. Some Swedish examples, some international examples what can happen when we have breaches. Uh, and this naturally leads then to the question, how much should we invest in order to protect ourselves? Uh, and this is a very tricky question. Uh, if, you, if you didn't know that already, uh, you will get a feeling for it throughout this talk. Um, but well, one answer is, well, this, uh, one over E, that is the, the um, the base in the exponential function uh, uh, of the uh, the expected uh, loss, not more than these uh, thirty eight percent. Um, so this would be the 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 candidate equation, so to say, uh, if we were to have it uh, on the curtain. And, and like I said, whether it deserves to be there or not, you can uh, decide for yourselves uh, uh, in uh, in a moment. Uh, but this is perhaps the the uh, the most uh, Famous, the one over E rule is, is perhaps the most famous aspect of the score on low model of, of investment. So, what is this paper? Well, basically, it's it's fitting that we are doing this uh, this year because it's now 20 years ago that it was published, uh, the ACM transactions on information and system security. Um, it's a paper by Lawrence uh, A. Gordon and Martin P. Loeb. Um, and uh, it's, uh, so to say, a first attempt. To answer those kinds of, of questions, how much should we invest uh, in information uh, security? Uh, and well, to, to understand the context, we, we could say that at this stage, uh, 20 years ago, um, um, the, the field of, of um, information security economics was sort of getting started. Um, there there was a, an increasing realization that information security or, or cyber security, as we perhaps would say these days, is not only a technical matter, but also uh, something that can be addressed from other points of view, such as economics, for instance, but also, of course, other aspects, organizational aspects, psychological aspects, and so on. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a time w w when uh, the field of information security economics is, is getting started. Uh, and this paper turns out to, to become one of those cornerstones. Uh, even you don't have to to uh, to agree with all of the assumptions, but but even if you don't, it's one of those which is good to know about uh, whenever you um, uh, you look at this field. 
Uh, right, so let's dive into, into the model. What, what is it they're discussing here? Well, basically, uh, they assume that you have an information set and you want to protect this information set. Uh, and then you say that, well, there is a loss here. Uh, if a breach occurs, well, this is a loss that would occur. So, so already this, you can, you can argue that it's a sort of a big leap. You turn uh, all these losses, which can be uh, sort of soft and intangible into a single hard number. You put uh, the, uh, a number of dollars onto it. Um, uh, right or wrong, but, but that's uh, the assumption. That's what you need to do in order to, to get off the ground here. And then you assume that there is a, a threat, a probability uh, from zero to one uh, of, of, um, of a threat occurring. And if the threat occurs, well, uh, then there is an additional probability, a vulnerability that this threat, uh, once realized, is actually successful. And then, of course, you can multiply all these together. So you have the product, uh, which is the expected loss uh, in the absence of, of investment. Um, and uh, Gordon and Loeb uh, basically keep the threat fixed. They, they, don't, they assume that you can't affect the threat. Uh, so uh, they typically just look at this uh, product, uh, T lambda, which is uh, capital L, the potential loss associated with that. Um, so this is this is what we're protecting an information set and uh, we're protecting it from a threat uh, which um, uh, can be realized uh, and then there is a vulnerability which leads to uh, an economic loss okay so moving on uh, what do we do we do an investment in order to increase security um, and again we do this investment in dollars um, and then we assume that there is a uh, function here, a uh, probability that this information set, which uh, has the uh, vulnerability V or the, the intrinsic vulnerability V, um, uh, will be breached. Uh, and this is a, a two valued uh, uh, function. It depends both on the investment and the, on the intrinsic vulnerability, uh, the security breach probability function. Um, and well, in order for, for the model to work, we need to assume that it's uh, continuously twice differentiable um, uh, in order to be able to find optimum. So, uh, so this is uh, where we're standing uh, in this model. Um, right. Um, and then uh, Gordon will now make three assumptions about uh, this function. Um, and uh, these, in a sense, are, are the core of the model. And of course, if you change the assumptions, then, then the results <laughs> also change, as always in mathematical models. So the first assumption is that uh, if the vulnerability, the intrinsic vulnerability, is zero, uh, the, the set is completely invulnerable, then it always remains so, no matter what investment you make. Um, uh, and that's, I think, reasonable. I, I haven't seen anyone challenge this part of it. Um, Second assumption uh, is that if you don't make an investment, the, the set simply retains its, uh, its inherent vulnerability. Uh, and again, this, this makes uh, sense. Um, the final assumption uh, is an assumption about the, the, uh, uh, the rates here uh, uh, of which um, uh, the, uh, the function, um, uh, uh, how the function works when you make the investments. So essentially, we have a condition on the first uh, derivative uh, with respect to the Z, the investment, uh, and another condition uh, on the second derivative. Uh, so what we have is that uh, making an investment makes the information more secure. Uh, the derivative is negative, uh, but at a decreasing rate, the second derivative is positive. Uh, so we have uh, sort of a classic economical case here of, of, uh, of uh, uh, decreasing marginal returns. Uh, and at the limit, uh, you can push this, uh, uh, this uh, probability down towards uh, zero, uh, but only sort of at an infinite cost. Uh, so in practice, you, you, will never, you will never be able to push the threat all the way down to zero. Um, but uh, so, so this is how how um, uh, the uh, the assumptions uh, look. Uh, you start off and you, you get an effect immediately. So for instance, this means that uh, uh, there are no 
fixed costs here, for instance, that you have to make first before you have an effect. The, the, the very first dollar you invest has an effect. Um, and then each dollar you put uh, in afterwards will have a, an increasing, uh, or sorry, a decreasing uh, effect uh, on pushing the threat or pushing the, the probability of breach down. Right, uh, moving on then. Uh, the benefit of making this investment. Well, the expected uh, benefit of a uh, information security investment then is simple to calculate. You have the inherent vulnerability uh, and you subtract uh, the the, uh, uh, the resulting vulnerability from your investment. Uh, you multiply this with, with the expected loss and, and the, there you have it, your difference. But of course, what you really would like to look at is uh, the net benefit as you also have to subtract your actual investment uh, in order to, to get the balance of, of, um, uh, of both. And this, of course, uh, uh, is uh, something which you can have a look at then and try to find uh, your maximum, uh, uh, your maximum uh, net uh, benefit of information security investment. So looking at the edge cases first, uh, uh, if the vulnerability is uh, zero, then you shouldn't invest anything. Uh, if the vulnerability is uh, in the uh, open interval uh, from zero to one, well, then the function is strictly convex uh, and the expected net benefit is strictly concave. Uh, and then you can easily just differentiate and find the interior maximum uh, first order condition. So what we have here essentially is that the uh, left-hand si side is uh, the uh, benefit, uh, or how much you decrease uh, your uh, your uh, um, uh, your um, uh, your vulnerability, and uh, the right-hand side is the cost. Uh, and of course, at the optimum, the marginal benefit equals uh, the marginal cost. Uh, so let's have a look at this uh, uh, graphically um, to illustrate and um, reusing the, uh, the uh, figures from the original paper here uh, to make this ex exposition. Uh, so basically what we have then is something that looks like this. We have a, a straight uh, line here, the, the, the one with the 45 uh, degree angle, which is your, your investment cost. Uh, uh, the cost, and then we have the, the benefit. Uh, and uh, we, uh, let's see, I'll, uh, I'll uh, show it like, uh, like this. Uh, so here we have the, uh, here we have uh, the, uh, the expected uh, benefit uh, curving away like this. Uh, so first we immediately notice up here that uh, the, um, uh, the expected benefit uh, will never reach unless optically will it reach the, this uh, product vulnerability times the, the uh, expected loss. Um, and uh, so what we're looking for here then is the, uh, the optimum. And we find it, as we said on the previous slide, we find it where the, uh, uh, where the, um, well, where the derivatives are the same, where the marginal cost and the marginal benefit are the same. So this is basically, we're looking for this tangent here. Um, uh, and when it equals the, the uh, investment, then here is our optimum. Um, and in this figure, of course, it's also straightforward to, to interpret that we're looking now for the, we're looking for the net benefit. Uh, then this is precisely the distance here between uh, the two lines. So we're looking for the maximum of, of that distance. So it starts out here at, at zero. There is no net benefit of, of an investment zero. It ends also uh, at zero up here. Uh, there is no net benefit here. Uh, but we're maximizing it right here. Uh, so it's important to notice, of course, that it's fully possible here uh, that uh, the optimal investment is, is zero. Uh, uh, if you have a, a less, so say, benign um, uh, function. So we could imagine, for instance, that uh, the, uh, the curvature doesn't look like this, but rather uh, it starts out something like this uh, with a smaller derivative. We could imagine something like this. Uh, and in that case, well, then 
it won't pay to make an investment uh, in security. Uh, it starts out uh, uh, below the, the cost and it remains below the cost throughout. Um, and uh, well, it's straightforward to see the conditions uh, for this in terms of, of uh, this uh, derivative uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the function. So to make this a bit more uh, concrete, um, we have then the first proposition, which they uh, proved uh, in, in, the, in the paper. Uh, and it's basically that uh, for all security breach probability functions uh, under these three assumptions, uh, there exists a loss uh, L on the range of vulnerabilities. Uh, in which increases in vulnerability result in an increase in the optimal investment in information security. Um, so this is basically what we can say somewhat less uh, the, formally that, well, uh, we can start out uh, considering perfectly invulnerable set and no investment makes sense. But if we then increase the vulnerability, uh, a bit, then at some point uh, it will be optimal to make some positive investment in information, in information security to reduce the probability of loss. Um, uh, and you can prove this more formally. But we'll move on to make the, uh, to expo well, for some exposition of examples here to, 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 uh, to understand better what this means. So, uh, and these examples are also from the paper and I'm also reusing again the figures um, from there. Uh, so Gordon and Loeb, they, they introduce a first family of, uh, uh, of, uh, of functions here. Um, um, and uh, it, looks, uh, it looks like this. So it, you, you have parameters alpha and beta, which basically are uh, parameters governing the productivity of, of investment. Um, so greater alpha, more productive uh, investment, greater beta, more productive investment. Uh, because, well, uh, you have this, uh, um, you divide the, the inherent vulnerability with another uh, larger number then. Uh, and looking at the, uh, looking at the, 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 uh, this, uh, the figure here, we can see we'll have the baseline here where you make no investment on the all. Uh, uh, we have a zero there. And then as you make ever increasing investment, uh, Z1, Z2, Z3, you see that all over the board, across the whole range of vulnerabilities, you're pushing the expected loss uh, down. Um, right, um, so again, we can make the, the observation that, that the expected uh, benefit uh, relative to the baseline of no investment uh, for any given vulnerability level, say here, you can compare the, the range here is the, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the benefit of investing at this particular vulnerability level at this particular Z1. If you invest Z2, then you get a bigger uh, uh, benefit. And if you invest uh, Z3, you get an even, even bigger one. Uh, and if you have a, a larger vulnerability, well, then in this case, uh, in this case, the, net, uh, the benefit grows, whereas with a smaller vulnerability, the benefit is smaller. Uh, right, so what's the optimum? Well, uh, looking at the first order condition in this case, uh, for the interior optimums, uh, we can find a closed uh, uh, form, uh, and that's convenient, of course. Um, uh, so this is the case when you have interior optima. Uh, looking at the condition for zero investment, uh, we can find a cutoff uh, um, a limit. Uh, so uh, the vulnerability has to be of a certain magnitude for it to make sense to make any investment at all in this case. Uh, so looking at this graphically, we have something like this. Uh, zero investment is optimal until you reach this threshold, and then you have uh, a growing, uh, but at a decreasing rate, uh, optimal level of, of uh, investment. So when you have this kind of, of functional form, then uh, a firm is better off if it concentrates its resources on the higher vulnerability information sets, because um, that's where uh, that's where you get. Uh, bang for the buck, uh, so to say. Um, and 
now it's important then to move on uh, to the second example that they introduce in, in the uh, in the paper uh, in order to contrast this with another uh, possible functional form. Um, and in this case, uh, again, we have a, a parameter here, gov alpha governing the, the productivity. Uh, and again, greater alpha means greater productivity. Uh, but with this functional form, uh, we have another uh, we have another uh, look, uh, or uh, it looks different basically when we when we look at that uh, the graph here. Uh, so again, of course, uh, you have zero investment giving zero benefit. Um, and then we have uh, again we see that for for greater investment we we have uh, a greater uh, reduction uh, in in the expected loss. Um, each of these uh, uh, curves is, is, uh, is below uh, each of the other ones. But what we don't have is a steady increase in, in the benefit. On the contrary here, we can see that uh, initially, the, the, uh, as the vulnerability grows initially, the benefit also grows. But then at some point, the benefits start to shrink again. And when you have uh, vulnerability, 100% vulnerability, uh, then uh, your benefit of investment is down to zero. Uh, so already here we can sort of intuitively see that this will be a different case. And uh, uh, looking at it uh, uh, with the uh, first order condition, uh, again, we can find uh, uh, an optimum for interior optimum, and we can find conditions for zero investment. Uh, and the interesting thing about this uh, condition for zero investment is that, it, well, it captures this this, uh, this intuition we, we had when we just looked at the graph. There is a zero uh, there is a zero area uh, in the uh, for low vulnerabilities uh, here, and there is a zero area for high vulnerabilities here. Um, and that means that uh, a firm is better off under this functional form. Uh, concentrating its resources on a mid-vulnerability information sets. Uh, so essentially we're saying here that, well, there are some information sets uh, which um, where the vulnerability is so low that it doesn't pay to try to protect them more. Uh, that's the lower range of, of zero investment. And then there are uh, some other information sets with a high vulnerability where the vulnerability is so high that it doesn't pay to invest to try to make it more secure uh, because it's you have thrown away uh, your money there. Um, so there is also this this high interval of zero investment. Uh, and basically, these examples, of course, together suffice to to show the, the second proposition uh, that they make in the paper that um, it's not necessarily the case that the optimal level of investment in information security is weakly increasing in vulnerability. Being. Um, and this is uh, well. This this might be counterintuitive. You you might have uh, intuitively expected that growing uh, vulnerability would always uh, uh, imply growing optimal investment, uh, but that's not the case. Um, and uh, as they they point out in the paper, the, the key here to, to when you're analyzing information security decisions is not the vulnerability. Uh, uh, as such, uh, the expect expected loss without investment, but it's the reduction that matters. Uh, again, the net benefit uh, of doing the investment. Uh, and this now uh, takes us to this third uh, proposition, uh, the, the one over E uh, rule. Um, so uh, for these two classes, uh, uh, the uh, of, of security breach probability functions that we just considered, um, well, then the uh, optimum is always uh, smaller than this one over e uh, uh, times uh, the vulnerability uh, uh, and times the um, uh, the expected loss. So this is the uh, again this would be the candidate sorry this would be the candidate uh, equation for for the uh, uh, for the uh, curtain. Um, uh, now, of course, the result here, it depends on the particular functional forms. Uh, and uh, like I said, this paper was published 20 years ago and, and a few years later, uh, it had been scrutinized by other uh, 
uh, researchers. So, for instance, Willemson uh, constructs a brief probability function that does satisfy the three uh, the three assumptions, uh, but where the limit is higher. So, well, the, the conjecture of Gordon and Lowell that that one over e would, would be sort of a, a ceiling is is not uh, not correct even with these exact assumptions. And if you relax the assumptions, well, then you can get arbitrarily close to 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 VL. Um, um, so, so in that sense, you could say that well, the, the one over the one over e rule, uh, it's not true. It's it, it doesn't hold unconditionally, and that's certainly the case. Uh, on the other hand, of course, what, what the, the entire exercise illustrates, and which I think is a, is a very worthwhile um, uh, takeaway, is that what really matters here, of course, is uh, how do these probability, security breach probability functions really look, uh, which is, of course, an empirical question. Um, if they do look like, like S1 or S2, then, then the one over E rule holds. If they don't look like that, well, then some other, um, uh, some other ceiling might be fine, found, uh, or perhaps some other ceiling uh, uh, cannot be found. You can get arbitrarily close to, to uh, uh, to one hundred percent of the expected loss. Um, so uh, here we have, uh, uh, like I said, the candidate equation, um, albeit or sorry, not equation, the uh, inequality, uh, with all its limits. Uh, so this naturally leads us to the question of, of sort of the uh, the limitations here of, of the model. Um, and the first one we already discussed, of course, uh, that uh, the proposition three. Uh, uh, depends on, on the, the particular functional form. Uh, we just discussed that, uh, but perhaps that's not the most interesting limitation. So, in my opinion, at least, it, it's it's more uh, well, it's more important. It's more uh, interesting to consider the fact that it's such an empirical different, uh, such a difficult empirical matter to find uh, the probabilities t and v. So the, the probability of a threat. Uh, and the probability of, of the vulnerability of the threat actually succeeding. Um, uh, and also, the magnitude of the loss is difficult to uh, find. Uh, and I could give an entire other seminar on that topic, uh, the how to uh, evaluate uh, the, um, the cost of, of uh, uh, cyber uh, incidents. Uh, but it's, it's tricky. Um, furthermore, this is a limitation that Gordon and Loeb themselves point out. Uh, as the model ignores uh, sort of the practical problems of, of decision making uh, within management teams, for instance, uh, or principal agent aspects, uh, where you have a principal uh, giving a task to an agent, uh, expecting the agent to fulfill that task. Uh, the model has none of those questions, which are clearly important aspects for how decision making is made in, in, print, in practice, but, but perhaps not, uh, yeah, it's easy to, to abstract them away in a mathematical model. Um, furthermore, the model only considers investments that protect a single information set. Um, so we're looking here, we have a single information set, we're investing to protect that one. If it's the case that our investments also uh, affect other information sets, uh, well, then uh, we need another model for that. Uh, fifth limitation, which I think perhaps is the most important, or, or at least it's, it's one of the, the important ones, is that the model here assumes risk neutrality. Uh, and this means, of course, that uh, it doesn't really apply uh, in the catastrophic case. Uh, I mean, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to be risk neutral uh, for uh, decisions where you have uh, a single, uh, or sorry, where you have uh, a, a threat sort of materializing over and over and over again. Uh, uh, so then, of course, in, in the long run, uh, risk neutrality is sort of the best, uh, the, the best um, uh, attitude. But if it's a one shot, uh, a really large uh, potential loss, a catastrophic loss, uh, well, then it makes sense to be risk averse, uh, and then the, the model doesn't cover that. 
Um, and the final limitation is that the, the probability uh, T here, the, the threat probability can't be affected. Uh, and that's also, uh, well, an important assumption to note because you, you could imagine cases where, where you would somehow be able to affect the probability of attacks, uh, for instance, uh, uh, by, by uh, doing some other kind of investment. Uh, and then again, you would have another kind of model. Uh, but all that being said, uh, even though we have all these limitations in the Gordon Low model, uh, it still uh, sort of remains uh, a cornerstone of, of information security the economics. Um, and well, there are many uh, there are many uh, extensions and, and variants of, of it in the literature. Uh, many of which, of course, address precisely these limitations, tries to expand it uh, by, by, for instance, adding uh, risk aversion or, or, or something else. Uh, but in order to understand those, it's, it's useful to go back to the, uh, the original uh, source and consider uh, the, the, the original Gordon Lowe model um, uh, the way it was published 20 years ago. Uh, it's also a, a one period model uh, and th this is uh, this means that well there are some aspects you can't capture uh, for instance uh, if you have a first mover advantage uh, well then you can't capture that in a simultaneous model um, then you need to make some kind of sequential game uh, and there are those examples in the literature as well um, but again uh, the uh, the model is, is uh, well the first step I think is to to understand this uh, the, the original model uh, and then you can understand the the additions and expansions as well uh, so that basically concludes uh, the, the talk and I'm happy to to uh, answer questions or, or participate in the, in the discussion.